get this thing rolling here. Um, thanks everyone for for joining. Um, we're talking all about DAOs, alt season, uh, igniting the next bull run. Um, and we've got B-Chain. Appreciate you guys um, coming up, sponsoring. Uh, my name is Joe Bazzani. I'm the co-founder CEO of Lunar Crush. I'm stepping in today for Mario and team. Appreciate them having me and really excited uh, to, to talk today about DAOs, um, the next bull run. Uh, excited for V-Chain to be here. I remember having you guys on our live stream and on Lunar Crush Live many, many years ago. Um, so I'm really excited, you know, to see what you're up to. Um, it's great to see some projects from last cycle coming in, um, similar to how Lunar Crush Coin is rebranding, recycling, and, um, you know, we're coming into another, another bull run here, which is going to be really exciting. And so I'm, I'm it's going to be fun to take, to talk a little bit about DAOs, the ecosystem that's out there. You know, I was part of the, the DAO, uh, in the early days, the original hack that set us on a, um, set us on a little bit of a. A backwards timeline for for DAOs, but it, it seems like it's it's coming back strong. Um, so you know, Sonny, maybe you can open us a little bit. You know, for even some of the folks out there in the audience that that have no idea what a, a DAO is, uh, you know, a decentralized autonomous organization. Maybe you can give like a quick um, overview of what is a DAO. Yeah, sure. Um, well, DAO, as uh, the name says, uh, decentralized autonomous organization which, let's say, is a new form of organization to run on the Web3 technology, you know, with um, the tokens, with the blockchains, the smart contracts voting and everything. Um, you know, it's, um, um, it's let's say, I, I would consider it's, it's a new format of, uh, even consider as a new format of organization of the humankind. Um, there have been lots of the different explorations or experiments in the past, but most likely folks on um, financial operations like, you know, Bankless DAO, uh, Curve DAO, um, basically using that kind of the community power to make a group decision for any kind of, um, you know, um, the flows of the monies or the investment goes, where the money investment goes. Um, but recently, we have been launching the new sustainability DAO. We call it the V Better DAO. We wanted to use that type of format to organize um, a decentralized solution for sustainability challenges. Actually, the very interesting conversation just happened uh, a week ago in Berlin when I was attending the Web3 uh, Green Web3 Summit with BCG. And one of the BCG partners just mentioned about, you know, sustainability is supposed to be everyone's mission and it's a decentralized challenge, which definitely requires a decentralized solution, which is Web3, which is, you know, DAO, um, as we believed. Uh, by the way, uh, actually, we have um, um, BCG partner Bernard, uh, Dr. Bernard wants to uh, join as well. If uh, it's okay, then you know we can uh, we can invite him over as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll get him up on stage for sure. Um, for some of the the speakers on here, give me a thumbs up um, if you are part of a DAO and you've been or have voted in a DAO in the last year. Any thumbs up? All right, we got a we got a couple. Um, maybe Ethan, um, maybe you want to hop up. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the DAO that that you're a part of, and and the Vice Cosmos. Um, and in our from our perspective, every Cosmos chain is a DAO. Uh, they all come with a built-in governance module that allows the um, <clears throat> the stakers on the chain to to govern the blockchain and, and and to vote on proposals. And so Cosmos is is actually quite well known for having a very active governance participation. We see. Um, there is a, a delegated governance system as well, so folks can, um, you know, they stake to validators and the validators can vote on their behalf, but then they can also override the votes of their validators if they don't, uh, if they don't like them. And so a lot of the Cosmos chains actually have pretty active, pretty active uh, uh, governance and, uh, you know, I run a company called Informal Systems and we're a validator on many of those chains, so we're voting on um, on a lot of the proposals, uh, really on the regular, um, you know, probably almost every day or so there, there's a vote, but, you know, some of the most interesting votes that have happened, say, in the last uh, in the last year or two, have been in and around the Cosmos Hub. So the Cosmos Hub, you know, was the first the first blockchain in, in Cosmos. 
um, and, and arguably uh, uh, the biggest. And there have been some very contentious votes going on there um, about, about its future, about its vision. Last year, uh, you know, we put up a proposal that we called Adam 2.0, which was a vision for, you know, for, for the future of Adam. And that was a very contentious vote that ultimately got voted down in the end. So it was quite interesting for like, you know, a group of developers that have been building this chain to um, they're working on this chain in a sort of decentralized way. They put up a, a proposal that they've been working on for a while and the community ultimately voted it down. Um, but more recently, we had, we had some success. Uh, our company and another company called Haifa put up a proposal to the Cosmos Hub that was also somewhat, somewhat contentious, which was for the hub to take responsibility for funding itself uh, and for paying its development team directly rather than having uh, an external foundation do it, which has sort of been the way it's been done uh, for a while. And, and that was also, you know, somewhat controversial and, and contentious, but ultimately it did pass. So going into 2024, the Cosmos Hub is for the first time taking responsibility for, um, for its own development. So, you know, in terms of the good and the bad, I mean, on the good side, it's amazing to see like, you know, decentralized groups of people spread all over the world coordinating to govern these on-chain on-chain systems in you know sort of transparent and verifiable way i mean it feels like there's nothing like that in the sort of broader political community so you know there's really really setting an example but the downside is there's a lot of fud and there's you know a lot of there's a lot of hate and a lot of immaturity in, in the way people approach things and i think we could all we could all do a better job of you know communicating better uh treating each other excellently you know having healthier and and uh, improved conversations using better language and you know really really um trying to surface the the, the crux of the matter and you know not using uh, ad hominems or, or, or things like this but to really um to really have good strong governance culture and so you know i've seen it degrade in, in a number of places but i've also seen it work uh, in a really excellent way and so it's it's, uh, it's interesting to be part of both even what what are some of the contentious votes and how does it work where is it 50 percent and then you know potentially depending on how many tokens yeah. or coins you have you you have a, a higher share in like in like treasuries and the foundation yes. vote and then you know because i agree with you i you know obviously we all have a try to have like a moral standing you know as a kid every birthday i would you know wish for world peace but at the end of the day yeah, you know we're, we're, we're fighting we're <laughs> fighting for something so you know how does it like when it gets down to that contentious moment and yeah. yes maybe you've got a ton of people that maybe own the token in an yeah. early day and they're maybe down 50 percent they're all pissed and whatever else it may be yeah. how do you guys deal with that yeah so i mean um all the most of the cosmos chains use a similar governance mechanism but they all have different distributions of their token so as far as we know adam has probably one of the most decentralized distributions of of the token it's been around for the longest it's you know it's been liquid for for a long time so there's uh quite sort of healthy distribution there uh there are there are large validators who control something like, let's say, the largest might control 6% or 7% of the network or, or something like that. I'm not looking at the moment, but it'd be easy for anyone to check. But the, the individuals can always override the way their validators vote. Um, and so we haven't really seen like necessarily a single voter or a small number of voters really control the outcome because, uh, at least on the Cosmos Hub, uh, because of the way... Uh, the token is so distributed. However, we, the governance module does have a, in Cosmos, does have an interesting mechanism. So normally the way it works is, let's say just using the Cosmos Hub as an example, anyone can put up a proposal. For the proposal to become active, there needs to be a deposit. So people, so you know, to prevent spam, people have to put up um, some minimum amount of atom and, and they get that back uh, afterwards. Um, and then uh, a quorum of the stake, so the amount of atoms that are staked to validators has to actually show up to vote. I believe currently that quorum is uh, 40%. So 40% of the stake has to actually show up for the vote to be valid. And then of the votes that show up, it's a it's, uh, you know, simple majority. So 50% um, can, can pass it. Uh, but there's also a mechanism called no with veto. And if a third of the, of the voters uh, uh, vote with a no with veto vote, then uh, then the vote is vetoed and, and canceled. And so the Adam 2.0 vote was actually vetoed. So it wasn't just, uh, I believe it was vetoed. Um, I can't remember right now. But it's an interesting mechanism that basically, uh, you know, it, it's basically respecting the way the underlying consensus algorithm works, where if a third of the validators choose to collude, they can censor votes. And so we've basically like surfaced that into the into the voting mechanism. Since that power already exists, we sort of make it explicit and say, OK, you can veto uh, and, and it requires only a third to veto. So there haven't been many proposals that have been vetoed. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like every DAO is like recreating our, like its own constitution. Right. Like you have to, you're creating some interesting rules and simple majorities. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's refreshing to see the innovation on it and to see what's working and what's not. I want to go to Paul. You, you raised your hand too. 
you know, the, the title of this is, you know, how DAOs are igniting the next bull run. You know, you, you said you're a member of some of these DAOs. Are, what are some, what are the majority of these proposals that are coming through about? And are they going to have a lasting impact on, on the chains that are there? Or are we still at a point in the cycle where it's, it's a lot of infrastructural grants that are coming through that people are proposing on or, you know, for, for like a layer one. So I'd love to hear, Paul, you raise your hand or if someone else wants to jump in as well. All right, we'll go, we'll go to someone else. Does anyone else want to grab that? You know, what, what are the majority of the proposals that you're seeing about and are, are these things going to have an impact? Go for it, Paul. Okay, so, so majority of the proposal that I've seen so far, uh, we're basically in, in two basic streams. So the first one was about uh, the major decision about the project development. And usually this was about uh, project development shifts. Like we had a boom, a bear, bear market. During the bear market, a lot of projects were going and doing very badly. Uh, so they were looking for new ways and new ideas how to re-evolve the, 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 the business, how to, um, um, how to make it more, much more interesting for the retail customers, how to bring much better product or something. And they were asking about those major changes that were impacting all the token holders um, within, with the DAO because at the end, they didn't want it to uh, be in the situation where after all, after decision is going to be made by the, by the project owners itself, um, uh, they will have an issue because everyone is not going to be happy about the changes and the direction of that business. So that's one thing. But also they are doing this because of the public consultations and ideas that they can grab from the community and engagement they can get from there. Because uh, the, the, the nice thing about this is that people usually, uh, the, 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 the intelligent ones are not thinking that they are the smartest guys in the room. So by having this crowd around you, you can, even, you can have some nice ideas and pick some interesting ones to implement, to, to, to put the project like on the right track. So that was the first uh, types of, uh, of voting that I was participating in and that was really engaging like some projects were, were, were really engaging especially if you were involved and, and uh, believed into the vision of the, of the founders and the second one was about the capital and uh, profit and money distribution so that was the second uh, the second type of voting where there were some kind of treasuries and project was running for example out of out, out of money and they were asking community, uh, telling that what the financial state of the business right now is, if they should liquidate maybe, I don't know, 5 10% of the treasury to get funding to run the project and to survive the bear market. And um, those were the main, uh, the main two uh, like vectors of the, of the questions have been, that have been asked within those DAOs. And, and what, about, what about speed? Right. Like, you know, it, it's kind of like move fast and, and break things. And, you know, if you're a new project or you're a new startup, a lot of times the only competitive advantage you have is speed. Right. Like there's yeah. no reason that Uber should even exist in a world where Ford and GM have the have these massive war chests of money. Um, they could have squashed them. Right. But they could iterate quickly. They could move fast. You know, you have voting and you've got a foundation and then you've got lots of people in your community, you know, can, can you still move fast? And like, then you need to, like, you need to distinguish two, two things then, like most of the, like a lot of projects are doing this wrong, in my opinion, because they are asking about everything, which is stopping the development and evol evolution of the company. And you are behind the ones that are, uh, are implementing the approach, as you just said. So um, I believe that you have two types of, of uh, conversations that you can have. Like, for example, if you have a big possible change that uh, the development would take a lot of time, uh, which is a major shift of, for the business, those are the things that are not the quick uh, changes. Those are not the quick things that can, you know, change, change something like super quickly and you need to make decisions right here, right now. So this kind of things are, this is the best to, to put it onto the voting, onto the conversation, discussion with the communities, etc. Like, um, should we make an upgrade on the blockchain to a new version? Should we implement a taxation or something? Like the, the big decisions, the big decisions. Uh, 
But then, then we have those those quick ones, and I I like just seen like a days ago the, uh, a, a decision a DAO decision that went wrong uh, uh, on my on my uh, friend's business, who was asking on those like uh, every basically aspect of the business, the community for the voting and. This is the basket, the investment basket. And he was asking the community, the token holders, if they should make this investment or not. And especially in the given, given market conditions where you have high volatility going up, going down different tokens, you know, um, you might lose the occasion. And that's exactly what happened. They asked the community about the investment. The token pumped up. The decision was yes. They bought and the token dumped and they lost because they couldn't make uh, decisions fast enough to handle the market situation. Um, so they are changing right now. They are putting onto the voting right now uh, sp uh, the, the split decision model where uh, about those fast and, and important investment, they can make decisions by their own in the best, uh, always thinking uh, in the best way about the company profit. But the ones, the major ones, decisions should still be voted on the onto the DAO because right now the DAO basically broke the uh, broke the uh, the thing and and make the company to to have a loss and and the whole community can blame themselves about how slow they were. Um, so yeah, so I believe uh, you you can do this and you can split this into those two types of decision that the crucial ones for development of the business and the, the the ones that take a lot of time to be implemented and the ones that are fast enough. And that's why you have people that are taking responsibility and are in charge of the businesses and projects that they should make those decisions that are uh, um, that are fast and, and they take responsibility for those decisions. So that, that would be my take on that. Sonny, you got, you got something to add. And then I do want to go to, to Dave a little bit to maybe talk about, you know, it, it is and are retail investors or are investors bullish on, you know, seeing Dow, Dow formation this year. But go ahead, Sonny. Yeah. Well, um, firstly, I agree with uh, what um, um, Power just just mentioned about in terms of the speed, that kind of the challenge. Honestly, if you uh, let's say if we think about the DAO or decentralization, centralization, I mean, in terms of speed, for sure, you know, centralization make the make the fast ones, like to make the fast decisions. But also, we see the obvious defects of the centralization. So, I think DAO is the answer to address these kind of the challenges um, and also bring up, uh, let's say, the efficiency um, somehow. And you, the funny thing is you, you just mentioned about, very interesting one, you just mentioned about the Uber or Airbnb, those kind of the, let's say, a little bit like a decentralized organization. Um, I, I think for the, for the Web3 world, in terms of the DAO, um, the better part is all of the users are not just the user, but also their investors. They also can be a partners in this kind of the new organization. And, you know, it, it just make the, the scaling up um, more faster. If you consider about the traditional internet mode, you know, basically um, a, a startup like Airbnb or Uber, they raise up the money. Um, from the venture capitals, so even they go to the IPO, they raise up the money from the market, and then they start to try to organize um, the decentralized drivers or, or, or hospitality hosts, and then try to organize in um, um, centralized protocol way. It could be run faster, but honestly, I think it's very costly and not so um, uh, transparent and not so, let's say, efficient in some other ways. So the, the funny thing is I, I just discussed with Bernard um, from BCG on, on this topic as well. Um, you know, I, I would like to invite Bernard also to, um, to talk a little bit about this one as well from, you know, BCG point of view. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we'll, 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 jump in. Go ahead. So, so, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi. So this is Bernard from BCG. So the interesting part about DAOs is, um, I mean, we are here in the, let's say, crypto community, digital assets community. We know the DAOs. We love our DAOs. We know how to set up DAOs and, and to engage people. The interesting part is that a lot of other, let's say, industries and players are, of course, looking into to our direction now, what we are setting up here. And um, it's not only the, that we build up DAOs, it's that we are able as you know, the digital asset space, we are able with our DAOs to um, 
engage the people of a community in a way such that they, they stay tuned, yeah, and they stay in the community, they engage with them, they, they talk about it, and so on. And this is, let's say, the loyalty program 2.0, actually. When you think of, I don't know, be it Apple, be it, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, uh, Louis Vuitton or uh, any other luxury brands, um, they, they also want to have, like say, communities um, that they are talking about um, what they do and that they might even vote for something in the community and so on. And again, we are kind of, I would see us here at the digital asset space with our DAOs as kind of front runners for many other uh, industries um, that again, now looking into our direction to learn from us and to, to also engage the communities. So that's actually very exciting, yeah. Martin, you got something, Dr. Martin? Thank you. Um, just, I'm very, very excited about the developments of DAO. Two years ago, I thought it would never work. But let us not forget one thing. Uh, we are all in this crypto blockchain community. We are used to undox people. All of the DAOs are about the governance of our own stuff at this point. What we are really looking towards is to make this a feature of the real world, right? And you do not have democracy without identity. You can have a secret ballot, but what you need is digital identity. The big missing piece of the puzzle is, do we want to create a world where there can be anonymous, undoxed actors? Or do we want a world where everybody has a identity on the blockchain universally, the way we are doing it with, uh, I think VeChain has a project there too. By the way, happy to see you. I was very impressed by your new roadmap. Um, you see that at Luxo, a group. So the different blockchains are working on digital identity solutions. So are governments. The idea that the DAO, as wonderful as it is right now, that this form of DAO will enter the real world Right, where we put democracy or board votes in a company on a DAO. For that, we need immutable, verified digital identity. And this is the big, big problem we need to solve because a large part of this crypto community is still stuck in the, in the 1980s and 1990s crypto anarchy spirit. And for blockchain, as it is now in the next 10 years, entering the main economy, we need to solve the identity problem. Then DAOs will really take off. For now, there are can, one can government model. Yeah. Can you expand on that a little bit and expound on that around, you know, what type mm -hmm. of voting would identity be positive for? And then is it needed for all of the voting? It is definitely not needed for all of the voting, right? If I am in a community, if I have a vote on, like we do in, uh, for example, ICP, the internet computer, uh, there's lots and lots of votes with your neurons, with your stake neurons. In order to be there, you have to be geeky enough. Uh, the people who don't understand what's being voted on, that by default, they, they vote yes. In a democracy, a large number of the people's votes really don't count because they, they, they have a default vote. But there is a legal issue. To this day, DAOs are recognized in, what, what was it? Wyoming. Yeah, we got legal representation of Wyoming, Wyoming. No other government, no other entity has recognized DAOs as a valid legal form. And that has to happen. And lawyers across the planet are working on how we integrate this. The European Union, for example, and part of a consulting team there, is trying to put DAOs into the European voting system. But for that, you have to have your national ID. We have to identify the person who's doing the voting. There is a big step from voting in a blockchain project to voting for a political party or for your next school principal, right? There are different types of votes. Some are perfectly okay if they're anonymous. But for DAO to go mainstream into the legal codex, become a feature of democracy, there has to be a solution to the digital identity problem. Yeah. Does so anyone have a counterpoint to that? that? And, uh, um, a not, a, Does, not a counterpoint, I just want yeah, to underline this. So I, I, I cannot agree can I more. Can I frame yeah. it? Can I frame it? Frame it a little bit? Um, a, a counterpoint in, you know, the, like, you know, people saying, hey, we want to be doxxed, we need identification, and then the, the anarchy side of, 
we, we don't need any of this. We need to completely reframe the system. You know, I want to be voting. I don't want anyone to know who I am. Maybe I could jump in if that's all right, guys. Um, how's it going? My name is Johnny Garcia. I'm here with uh, Circularity Finance, built on the XTC network. We're a DAO that finances regenerative finance DAOs. So it's actually a personal topic to ours. So I'd love to be able to jump in if I could just to share a little counterpoint here. Anonymity has not helped us at all. It actually provides better customer service to have some kind of idea of who you talk to. Um, that's really important. Second, it allows us to be able to really build communities where we can identify what it is that we want to see in the sense of when you have a blockchain, the blockchain may have a specific focus, but maybe the community has a different focus and it allows us all to kind of build off of it. And because of the type of structures that we can create, I think as soon as I jumped in, I heard loyalty points 2.0. I love that because that is actually one of the main reasons why our entity, our lab, actually, our labs entity is actually based out of Wyoming, trying to best understand how to build around the DAO's modules. As you said, Martin, um, it was actually about the DAOs being LLCs and, and the first ones to actually have a chance to build some structure for stability. So what we've done is to take some of the models that everybody wants to apply, which is a gold-backed ecosystem. So we added that. We added governance. We added the opportunity to finance regenerative finance or regenerative business models, which are focused on sustainability. And that's why we partnered up with the Green Cross because under the UK chapter, we're actually working with Melitor based laws or model laws of uh, electronic transfers of records so that we can actually improve trade finance directly from a KYC starting point. So we KYC all our users, we KYB all our businesses, and you do not get the right or the opportunity to use any of our business tools to create digital assets without having your business registered. And this allows us to create a new level of customer service that I do believe adds a great counterpoint to the way that things can go forward. Just wanted to speak on that briefly to see if it can help us move the conversation forward. Thanks for having us. Of course. Another bold, bold hey, Just applauding uh, here. See. So just applauding here. I, I'm very familiar with you. Uh, I'm a big fan of XTC oh. from, from day one. And I'm very familiar with what you're doing. So you, you hit the nail on the head. This is exactly it. Yes, there are certain aspects where anonym anonymity can be a feature, but the main use case for, for, for companies, you can't run a company with anonymous people on the board. You can't have a Blue Jay uh, or a, I don't know, a weasel or a board ape having a seat on your company board. That's just not possible. <laughs> well, I agree. Right. What, um, Wendy and then Antonio. Um, so I've actually been thinking about DAOs a lot. Um, I, I think in crypto, it gets kind of complicated when we talk about like level the playing field out, because that's essentially why most people are here. And one of my concerns with them is, is that, you know, people like whales, people that got in early, they always have a, a more substantial amount that they can contribute to essentially sway the vote. But at the same time, it's like, I feel like it's a problem that's always going to be there regardless. And I do think that DAOs are extremely important. And as far as being anonymous, when it comes to DAOs, um, I think that there is a time and a place for it. But if we really talk about integrating blockchain technology with actual voting, because let's face it, I feel like that's one of the biggest problems like globally with transparent voting in almost every single country or every single entity, city, etc. Um, I think that you like doxing would be extremely important. And as far as the whole customer service thing goes with um, with being doxed, I agree with that to an extent, but at the same time, like it really depends what type of um, what type of company or what type of um, what type of, I guess, project is needing you to dox for customer service? Because at the end of the day, like we're talking about customer service, I've, I've worked in customer um, service my, almost my entire life. You don't really care who you're talking to, just as long as they can get the job done. You don't care because let's face it, in 2024, we have all of this tech, we have all this automated services. And even if you report wrongdoing or something that happens or poor customer service, nobody cares. Like the, nothing ever ends up getting back and nobody cares. So that's just my personal opinion, though. Could I just briefly touch on what was one of the main reasons why we chose to go that way? I, I love where you're coming from, Wendy. Um, because what happens in this space is you may have a wallet, but you don't have their email. And because you don't have their email, there's no way to really get in touch with somebody to provide that customer service. 
essentially being able to understand what is their troubles, how can you find somewhere to communicate with them beyond the initial transaction on the chain. And so being able to create not only the ability to create transactions, but to be able to offer that customer layer or customer service layer is just as important as being able to add interoperable data layers. Because you're not just trying to do transactions, you're obviously trying to deliver to the best of the service possible. And I'm really happy to know that DAOs and doxing are actually getting the chance to really be discussed because if we could find a way forward where obviously everybody feels like at least voting upon, you know, where do we move money or how do we move money starts the discussion. And then from there, I think we're going to arrive at wonderful systems that I think everybody could be proud of. Antonio, you got some thoughts on this? Yes, I mean, hi everyone, first of all. Um, as a CTO here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit technical. I think we are, we are talking about three different things, really. It's one is when it comes to a DAO and then to governance in general, etc. One is identity, okay? Uh, who is who? Who is behind that, that voter, okay? Uh, identifying the person, which in some cases may be necessary, in others, no. Um, it's a little bit, you know, the, the, the concept of what WordCoin is trying, is trying to achieve and others, other identity providers in, the, in general that are going to then interoperate with, with, with Web3 uh, infrastructure, with Web3 companies. Then you've got the anonymity of vote. So identity, anonymity of vote, and transparency of vote. These are three different things. And these are three different features. So you want to know that there's one person that is going to vote so you, you know that may, in some cases, you know that there's going to be a, a digital identity assigned to someone uh, for that particular voting, which is very important. So you know the people that are going to vote are going to be known. Okay. But then you need the vote to be anonymous in some extent. Uh, like you need, the, you don't, you need to be able not to tell what someone has voted because that could have implications. And then you have the transparency though. You need to be able to, as a voter, I need to be able to check that my vote, my vote has been accounted for. And you, as, as, as in the DAO itself, need to be able to check that all the votes have been, you know, casted by, by, by the, let's say, KYC people, by the identified people. So we're talking about three technical, three different things here. Uh, identity, anonymity, and transparency. And they can all be achieved. Uh, it's not easy, but that's where we need to get to that, that just my two cents here okay no i think that i think that's great and yeah i, I want to you know we're gonna we're gonna get to the the ama here soon with uh b chain real quick you know dave if you're there um you know all this sounds like a beautiful vision right you know we talked about even all uber drivers voting together in a in a decentralized way you know but from a from a standpoint of of the market you know our our dow's bullish for the market, do investors care? I'm just going to share a little bit of insight on our side of things. Um, they've had a great response to the concept of a DAO. Just because many are, like uh, I think Wendy brought up, the concept of a whale is really a turnoff. And so DAOs that can find different ways to incentivize um, asset acquisition, such as liquidity mining, um, I do think that they help kind of neutralize the playing field here by minimizing the amount of tokens that enter circulation at the very early stages and then increasing the ways that people can go ahead and participate, such as bounties and decentralized processes. And, and I think that these are the things that allow us to really, from the community, be able to move into the ecosystems because I think that that's one of the things that we don't often talk about when we talk about DAOs. We talk a lot about governance, but not enough about decentralization. And that's also how bounties allow others to take part of what you're building. And when you allow others to take part of what you're building, they feel proud to be a part of it because they contributed. And I think that that's what builds better nations on chain. And that's what essentially what DAOs are. They're nations on chain that if we can learn how to really build collectively and interoperable, then we start to really share in the value that each can create. I think that's an extremely fair, fair answer. Um, Ethan, you got a, a last chime in here. Um, do investors care, or if there's anything else you want to chime in on before we get to the AMA? Uh, yeah, I, I was hoping to comment on the, the whole privacy identity thing. Um, to make a similar point as Antonio, that basically privacy and identity are not exclusive. 
you know, we need we need to make sure that all of us are putting forth that privacy is a fundamental human right and that we won't that we don't compromise on that. That doesn't mean we can't have strong identity. That doesn't mean we can't have one person, one voting systems. Those are difficult to build, but throughout all of that, we can we can still maintain privacy for everyone, and that's that's important to protect. You know, basic um, basic human rights uh, to, to participate, you know, freely and, and to express your your you know true feelings and opinions without being persecuted against. As to whether DAOs are you know bullish or not, I'm I don't know exactly how to answer that. I mean, I think there's a the larger story for me is that I think we're on the on the cusp of large scale constitutional reform on the you know on the order of what happened in say the mid 19th century when we had the emergence of uh, of of corporations of you know new kinds of banks and. Um, you know, post-industrial revolution, all this kind of stuff. I think that, uh, you know, the, the really the formation and, and uh, rise to prominence of nation states, I think that's the sort of um, level of revolution that, that, that's ahead of us. And, and DAOs are in kind of very early, early stages. But um, that's the, the kind of period I'm interested in, in navigating us through and really having a, you know, grounding in, you know, philosophy and history and theory of, of money and organizations and all this stuff to really navigate that uh, in, in, in a mature way so that we can we can build a better world here. Yeah. I love, I love that. And, and that's why I personally, I'm, I'm bullish on everything, you know, just the way that you're structuring your thought process around history and prosperity and, you know, moral compass around what's going on. Um, you know, so with, with that, um, I do want to, you know, turn the, the stage over a little bit here to the VeChain team and, uh, and Sonny. Um, you know, I, I started following VeChain a long time ago. Um, and was, you know, always very impressed around, you know, I think you guys had some some deals with Walmart back in the day, um, you know, utilizing, um, you know, some of the con like larger consulting companies as validators. And I loved I love that model. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the V Better DAO and give you the, the stage here for um, a quick uh, two minute pitch. And then we can have some of the speakers if you can hang around and, um, you know, ask some ask some hard but solid questions. Um, you know, for, for Sonny and team, and we'll get this thing going. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Um, well, actually, I, I want to share um, a very interesting story first, you know, before we go to uh, V Better Dow. Um, we have been discussing, especially with BCG, you know, to talk about the sustainability challenges. Um, what we believe is, you know, the missing puzzle is actually to miss uh, the current sustainability implementation is miss um, the individual involvement. However, there are a huge amount of people out there around the whole world have been making a small fractional effort, which is not really, you know, visible or recognizable by most of the people or even rewardable. And actually, the funny thing is when, when you, let's say, walk around in the street, stop someone, let's say a random guy, and ask um, a question, Will you do something about sustainability? And most of the reaction, the funny enough is, you know, they come back, you know, ask like, okay, how, how much money do you need? So usually you feel like you have to pay extra to do something sustainable or you to contribute to sustainability, which I don't feel right about it, <laughs> you know, because I, as, as a simple logic, if you do something right, do something positive, you should get rewarded other than just pay extra about it. Um, so what we, we try to do something differently. Um, uh, we launch the V better DAO for three things, actually. Firstly, um, is about what to do is actually we wanted to foster different type of, uh, we call X to earn type of applications to incentivize individuals to do the positive behavior. That's the first. Secondly, about how, um, we want to use DAO formats. We want to give the power back to the people to let the people to decide which um, the allocation, which the, the funds or new tokens should be allocated in which type of the project to, you know, enable and, and motivate people, incentivize them to do the right thing. And last but not least is about the purpose. Why? Why we do that? Because we believe the collective value is going to be a very, very impressive so we, uh, for example, we did um, a very interesting experiment last November in ATP Torino. Just less than two months, you know, there were more than 2,000 people locked about 450,000 actions, resulting in saving 3,000 tons CO2 and 9 million gallons of water just coming from a small fractional effort on, the, on everyone's life. 
you know, for example, you can you can choose to, um, you know, take the metro or bus other than drive your own car. You can drive EV. You can even drink coffee without um, the wasted materials or choose the sustainable products other than consuming numerous resources. So all of the small things, if we are able to put them together, it's a huge, impressive uh, collective value, which, uh, you know, could be monetized. So that's all about the WeBet it all. Uh, in summary, it's a new ecosystem for targeting for sustainability wants to involve every individuals coming to um, either build or um, play inside of the different um, X to earn applications to create the collective value for sustainability. So if I got that right, it, if you're just going about your daily life and you're choosing more sustainable ways to live, you're going to get rewarded um, for that through being a part of some application that's integrated with the uh, with VeChain. Exactly. Can you give an example um, of some of the vision around maybe you know one of the apps or, uh, or the DApps that might be out there? Like you said, like maybe I chose to drink a more sustainable cup of coffee, right? What's the actual kind of user experience for someone? Um, you know, that's a part of that. Are they paying with a specific wallet that confirms that that is a sustainable, um, you know, logistics and supply chain that's going on? Like maybe talk a little bit about that because that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, Jake, you want to fill up? Yeah, sorry, I jumped the gun there, but um, I was just going to throw in a relevant example. Hello, everyone. I'm Jake. I'm the comms lead at VeChain. Uh, yeah, on the back of that, there's a great example that we um, developed a few years ago, which is around electric vehicles, right? And you, you drive an electric vehicle, you do X amount of distance in your car, and uh, that amount of carbon offset can be calculated against you know, a normal kind of gasoline-powered vehicle, and then essentially earn a credit for the amount of carbon that you offset, which is attached to the actual value of a ton of carbon emissions. So in that sense, you're kind of using blockchain to kind of tie these um, externalities of resource use to uh, a token so you're you know using a web3 approach to essentially give value to something that's not often kind of factored into you know the consumption process which in that case was your the actual financial cost of you offsetting that carbon so in that ecosystem i think uh, it was something like 50 dollars a year essentially equivalent if you drive around 15,000 miles or something but which doesn't sound a lot individually but you know when you scale that up and you're talking tens of millions of EV drivers, you know, it becomes a, a massive amount of value. You know, 10 million cars, $50 each. You know, we're well, looking at like half a billion in this collective value. So when, you know, when we talk about collective value, that's what we kind of mean. It's like tying together these smaller actions through blockchain to create this large scale impact. And it's pretty clear to me where the, you know, if someone earns some token, they earn some points, rewards, however you guys are, are structuring that, um, you know, maybe they hold that and, and stake that somewhere, or maybe they, they decide to sell that. Um, where where does the, the bid come from, right? Where does the input here come from to, you know, correctly fund, um, you know, the, the actual rewards and the almost like the gamification of the sustainability choices? Yeah, it's a good question. So obviously at that point, I mean, just to, Take it back one step. We we launched our white paper, Web Free for Better, and we talked about this concept of blockchain biospheres, and that's like this sum total of what we dubbed ecosystems, of which what I just mentioned was this kind of ecosystem, right? And within that model, you have obviously uh, you know various kind of partners as well. So actually, in that specific example, you had vendors of all kinds, like uh, insurance providers, you know, food and beverage providers. There was even a healthcare as a, one of the oldest hospitals in Asia involved. You know, so you, you essentially build this ecosystem of enterprise uh, commercial clients that can you know, give value then to the token as well. So it's this mutual kind of um, ecosystem in essence where they're supporting sustainability causes you know, by proxy, by allowing you to spend these tokens in these locations. And I mean, that essentially, yeah, that's, that gives value to the tokens as well, right? Because you've priced in this externality, but then you could go on and spend that token. So it gives you that incentive mechanism to actually do the action, earn the reward, and then for a byproduct of something you're already doing, which is the key thing of why Web3 and sustainability work so well, you generate value that you can spend. 
and yeah, and also, go ahead, Sonny. Yeah, and also in t on top of what Jake just mentioned, um, high level, I want to share something, you know, uh, based on some of the co-worker with co-working results with, uh, with the BCG together. Actually, there's a research to show by 2030, um, the total uh, GDP of sustainability across the whole world is going to reach $26 trillion. And actually, the, the, that big money is coming from, majorly coming from the reproduction process for most of the products we have been using on every day. Um, uh, whatever the cars you're driving, the, the, the garment you're wearing, or uh, anything you use, um, not only about the material per se, for sure, ma recycled material is uh, a big part, but also in terms of the process, how to manufacture that, how to uh, make a transportation uh, in terms of logistic, in terms of supply chain. So there are many um, areas which could be lead to a sustainable products. So in terms of the entire market value, let's put it this way, it's, it's, I would say it's, it's huge. It's massive. And, um, you know, for what we try to do is we're gonna, we're gonna have like two, um, pillars of the work majorly. The first one is we wanted to build up and foster not only us, but actually enable more and more builders to build the different type of external applications to cover a different uh, perspective of the life. Um, what uh, Jake just mentioned is about the driving to earn. Actually, we also have a couple of new candidates um, in the in the V better dies as a pilot case as well. One is we call it a mug shot. So basically, you can from the user experience, you every time you drink coffee, um, if you don't use any kind of recycled material, you can take a take a picture and upload to um, a server. And then the, the, the AI behind that will recognize if it's really um, a co coffee mug with a coffee, not just um, a Coca-Cola drinks or any kind of tea even. Um, and then based on that, give you rewards um, in terms of the token. So the different type of actual application will, let's say, enable and motivate more individuals living a sustainable life. On the other side, um, the, the, the other important job actually we're working with BCG together is try to, let's say, get um, the utility of the token and even the value proposition about the token to engage the Web2 companies, the traditional companies, which is actually a vision strength, to bring them on board into the V Better DAO ecosystem let their products, their services, or even simply say the value injected into the ecosystem. Uh, simply to say, I wanted to make a you know very simple example. Um, any company can provide the products, the recycled products or sustainable products into the ecosystem as one of the marketing costs. So instead of sending some group of people in the middle of the desert from some trees to say like, we're doing the sustainability, the future enterprise could, you know, make a very specific, like I, I invest a million dollars, um, you know, with certain amount of products to motivate or incentivize uh, 200,000 people to do X, Y, Z as the new, um, you know, a factual reports in the ESG or in the, um, you know, SDG, that kind of the budget allocations. So, Eventually, we wanted to have built up a full cycle of ecosystem, not only with individuals, but also with enterprises. The difference we want to make is we, we're going to go through the Web3 way, which means the enterprise or the platform and the user, we're in an equal position. It's not just like, oh, you're the consumer or the, you're the retail investor or you're the, you know, uh, normal uh, users for most of the for most of the products, but like we're gonna work together. You do your part, I do my part, and then we share the value together. No, that makes a lot of sense, and it seems like even a Web two corporation would really want to align themselves with these positive externalities of sustainable choices. You know, especially from some of the consultancies, which is why I suspect Bernhardt and BCG are interested in maybe communicating this to like a Fortune five hundred C suite. Um, you know, Bernhard, go, go ahead. So I, I just want to add something. So um, everyone knows now that we have a climate problem. This is an ability problem. Yeah, 
and everyone also wants to do something and want to share something. But if you go around and ask them, okay, what do you do today to, to make the planet a better, a better place in the future? There is no anger, right? I mean, what, what should I do now, today? Yeah? And when we combine this now with this incentive program that Sunny was talking, Eugene is talking about, this basically gives everyone the possibility to say, well, today I'm taking another mark. Today I'm not going to the grocery store. Uh, I'm not driving to the grocery store. I'm going there by foot or take the public transport. And then you get re rewarded. Yeah? And this then basically incentivizes all the people to do so. Yeah? What we as BCG will help reach in, in the future uh, probably is that we um, uh, reach out to the existing big companies, existing big corporations and brands to bring them in to say we find use cases for all these existing big brands because they are known out there in, well, um, uh, across the globe, right? So the Louis Vuitton, the Walmarts of this world and so on and so on, yeah? So people rely on them, people interact with them, people buy the products. So we need to bring them in, again, this is our job then, um, in order to find those incentive programs and everywhere where people are interacting with big corporations, there are also some sustainable, uh, some sustainable action to take. And this is exactly the, the, the angle that, that Legion is taking. These uh, sustainable actions are incentivized with this new better token, and then you can also use it from one app to another app, so cross app, so to say. And this is really, I mean, I, it's an amazing idea, and it's actually an, a very noble mission that Vichen that, that is on at the moment. And then who are these, these people, right? Like, who, who is the persona that you believe will be the, the person that makes that sustainability choice? Are we talking millennials? Are we talking Gen Z? Like, wh who is the, the customer here? I don't like everyone. I don't like everyone. Yeah. I, I think it's about everyone. Um, only thing I just want to give you guys some of the examples. A few years ago, I was meeting with a uh, manufacturing department of the Amazon. They mentioned about, you know, Jeff Bezos um, decided to put $10 billion every year to support sustainability um, course across the entire Amazon group. But actually, um, the idea is coming from the think tank group, uh, which has like, uh, you know, advisor to Jeff Bezos is based on the research, based on the, the let's say, yeah, uh, the analysis, the millennium people, especially about the millennium people, are very into um, sustainability, per se. Um, like this becomes like, um, you know, I would say the, the mindset, the mentality for those people. And we don't want to only stay with them, but also, you know, starting from, uh, the passion people passionate about the sustainability and they also want to see the visible uh, results and eventually scale up and motivate more people to um to do the same go ahead you got another comment yeah uh two comments actually just on the back of that i think one of the key things about this approach is like you know you ask who is the demographic but Ultimately, it's like whether you like sustainability, whether you don't care about sustainability, this mechanism's powerful because, you know, if you can earn some kind of incentive or reward or discount just for doing something that, you know, you might do anyway, you might be interested in doing like, hey, I like riding my bike to the shop so it's no skin off my nose to actually do it. You know, I think you appeal to a broad demographic anyway, even if you don't kind of wrap it up in this kind of green cloth. And also another thing on the kind of, you know, on the, from the kind of business perspective now, you know, obviously VeChain is well known for supply chain, stuff like that. I mean, with the regs you've got coming in in Europe right now, you know, sustainability reporting throughout supply chain, scope-free carbon emissions, all that stuff is becoming mandatory anyway. And it's like, you know, blockchain is the tool to tile this information together. And then these companies, they're going to have all this information. You know, it's the kind of uh, building in these kind of consumer engagement programs on top is you know, just an easy win for companies that want to kind of expand their marketing, reach engagement. So, you know, it's like, it's, a, it's quite a holistic thing. It's not something being kind of tacked on the end of the commercial life cycle. It's going to become a, a fundamental element of product sourcing, logistics, all that kind of stuff. 
yeah, the, the passive earning side of it for doing the things that you already are doing makes sense. You know, if you're someone, you know, that likes to turn the shower off in between soap, you know, because you're trying to save, save some water, you know, you want to, you, you want to be rewarded for that outside of just the five cents you save, right? You're, you're trying to do something good. So um, if you're already doing those things, it makes sense. I do want to take a question from the audience. Rachel, you hopped up. Do you have a, uh, a question for a uh, comment for the team here? And then uh, Ethan, Paul, anyone else on stage got anything before we wrap up? Hey, yeah, it's Rachel here. I'm a reporter with Cointelegraph and Crypto News, and I'm host of Web3 Deep Dive Podcast. So I think this is a great model, but my concern is just like how the mainstream will actually want to, like, is this an easy experience for the mainstream to use? And will the incentives and those funds be kept safe? Like, how are we going to explain that to a mainstream audience to enable that side of adoption. So that's just like my one concern with all this. But I do think it's a great model and I think it's a great way to promote sustainability. Yeah, I, I can take this question actually. Um, well, you, you're, you're mentioned, um, firstly, thank you very much, Rachel. This is a great question. Actually, that's our ultimate goal because sustainability is not just for Web3 or crypto people. Actually, it's about everyone's mission. So um, what we try to do is, you know, go through the crypto community first and then eventually, you know, progressively scale up um, to give more seamless user experiences to the normal people. Actually, I think it is the right time right now because we do have lots of the regulatory service provider um, are able to build up a fantastic solution, technical solution, you know, to engage um, the people, even without knowledge or how to manage a wallet, um, non-crypto people, what I'm just saying. So actually, we did um, some of the experiment in the last year. Uh, in one ATP event in May in Rome, we worked with one of our uh, community projects, Water V, using that kind of um, um, custodian type of uh, wallet to able to engage thousands of non-crypto people to holding the NFT, participate in some of the campaigns, uh, speech, you know, something like that. So also, there are many regulatory uh, service provider. what I just mentioned, uh, in terms of, for example, like a Firebox as a custodian service or a different fiat ramp um, is able to provide that kind of infrastructure uh, to engage different um, Web2 companies come to join very easily. So basically, um, from the user experience, let's say if you're a non-crypto user, you do something, you do have the rewards. Um, even it's not the token in your wallet, but it's, let's say, in the custodian wallet, but also there is a fiat ramp or a different fiat, um, let's say, service provide payment service, allow you to exchange the different products or participate uh, different um, programs, then it's it's like a, a universal loyalty programs as what Bernard just introduced in the beginning, but not limited to one um, airline company or one um, retail company, something like that. Yeah, and Rich, to give you an example of what that looks like, that we've this we've got some technical integrations coming. It's super cool. It's like you know, essentially social logins, right? So you you log into your app, username, password, boom, done, and then. Your wallet's attached in the back end. You've got like cloud recovery services attached to it. So you interact through these apps just like you interact through any app and you receive these tokens that to you are just points, however they're kind of branded. You know, they look and feel the same as many kind of loyalty schemes you already see, but they happen to be crypto assets. So, you know, in that, through that vector, you can actually really seamlessly integrate a concept everyone's already very familiar with, but they actually have monetary value and they're on blockchain instead. Antonio, you got something to add? Yeah, if I may, just to, just to close on this one. I mean, the, it's really a bridge, and uh, Jake said it all, to be honest, but it's really the bridge between Web 2 and Web 3 uh, in terms of user experience. And, uh, you know, things like, uh, Sandy mentioned, five blocks, so custodial services, uh, social media login, as, as, as Jake said, and hence, this is done by account abstractions on wallets and, on, and smart contracts. 
you're busily making the user experience seamless, seamless, and and that that that's where you want to go. You wanna you wanna kind of uh, get the web to easiness of 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 uh, of, of of UI UX within the web tree. Uh, and I think we're very close. We're very close. Um, the entire the entire world of Web three is getting there slowly, but you know it's it's a priority now. It was identified you know a few months ago. I think probably almost a year ago by even Vitalik saying you know it's we need to get to the billions of users as in the Web three space to 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 really to really make a difference and uh, and uh, the user experience of the wallets and of the apps and making sure that everything looks like a web tool experience like a mobile experience that we know that's that's where the answer lies really I, I think you're right and i think we've crossed the chasm from the it's it's not a matter of if anymore it's a, it's a matter of when um and so Absolutely. you know to wrap to wrap up here you know everyone in the audience you know make sure you give all these speakers a follow We've pinned the, the VeChain uh, tweet up there. Give that thing a like. Give it a retweet. Um, give that account a, a big follow here. And then, you guys, I, I'd love to just to wrap up. You know, it's a year from now. Um, what What's the headline that you want to see? You know, give Rachel a plug in Cointelegraph or, you know, maybe it's a Forbes. What's the headline that you want to see um, a year from now with regards to, you know, the with the VeChain or DAOs in general? Um, I would say like we better DAO is a sustainability platform um, for everyone. Any other takers? What's the headline? What do you want to see? The announcement? Um, wh what's the world look like a year from now? We better DAO. So um, <laughs> colon breaking down barriers. Now, I think you know it's an interesting innovation of the uh, you know of the DAO model. Right? I don't think we've touched exactly on. The DAO composed of VBetter DAO, but you know it's essentially a DAO governed DAP ecosystem. So I think you know having some social commentary on the kind of take on the DAO model and how it's kind of unleashed this DAP revolution. Obviously, that would be that would be the line we'd want to see somewhere. I'd love ah. to see states issuing selective disclosure, zero knowledge identities for their citizens. I think that would be a major step forward. Definitely. Yeah. I, I just want to see like results in a year from now, like the results that this DAO is enabling sustainability. And then that would be really cool to write about based on data and results. And I think that will also help drive mainstream adoption as well. Absolutely. Well, last one. Yeah. So what I would love to see is that uh, in terms of DAO, the headline that, uh, those elections, 2024 or eight, five, uh, 20, uh, 200 million Americans voted for president using the DAO system on the blockchain. So that's what I would love to see. That is a big, a big dream, my friend. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank, thank you all for being here. I could tell we have a bunch of very smart, passionate people that care about this industry and moving everything forward. Um, I appreciate you guys. Everyone go check out uh, VeChain at VeChain Official. Mario, appreciate everyone for hosting the Roundtable crew behind the scenes. And uh, until next time, everyone, thank you. Alt season. Next bull run is here. Cheers, all. Let's go.